somebody next to you. And find out uh, whether your neighbor has a Bible. And uh, report him to me if uh, otherwise. Does the person have a Bible? Uh, tell your neighbor, don't do that again if he doesn't have a Bible. <laughs> well, we are going to look at... Um, I think we are beginning to uh, talk about our theme now from today. Okay. So I want us to focus on the... Uh, can you still remember our theme scripture? What is it? Can we have it on the screen, please? John what? Or can somebody read it for me? Who wants to read it for me, please, if you can? Who would want to read it for me? Can somebody read it for me, please? And somebody, again, open to the book of uh, the most common verse in the Bible. The most popular scripture in the Bible that you know. What is it? That's, that's right. John 3, verse 16. Somebody to read it for me, please. John 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Mm -hmm. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Yes, okay. Yes. All right, Jordan 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that so whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wonderful. Okay, let's look at this last chapter, and I want everyone to read it out loud the book of john 15 verse number 13. i want us to read it together one to go read it again Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. We may be seated. Can I see those of you that enjoy the word of God? Tell me, is the word of God something that excites you? Yes. Are you convinced that uh, it is only the word of God that brings change to your life? Yes. Do you believe that when God speaks, you live? Yes. There is life in the word of God, right? Yes. When God spoke to me about the theme that we have this year, which is the year of the greater life, he had uh, opened up my mind spiritually and showed me the different kinds of lives that can be lived. And each life requires a certain type 
of faith. It's not one life that is lived by every living thing. There are different types of lives. And each life in terms of its continuity is determined or decided by a certain kind of faith that you apply towards it. So life is not one. There are different types and different kinds and different levels of life. There is a lower life. There is a medium life. There is a greater life. The life that is above every other life. Now remember some few months ago when we had our conference, it was the, I think the Billionaire's Mindset uh, Summit, and I released a statement that I knew was very, very controversial because it even contradicted my former beliefs in my previous teachings as well. And I said the problem with Christians, why we suffer and why we cannot enjoy the benefits of the cross, it is because Christians have given their lives to God. And that's our number one problem. Every Christian who has given his life to God is in trouble. And that trouble can never end. Because we started at a very, very wrong foundation. And I remember many times during crusades, I would also invite people to come and give their lives to Christ. And when he told me, God, when he told me that's wrong, I was even ashamed. I said, so how am I going to delete all that? People heard me saying that. He said, this is wrong. So God always talked to us and we need to repent at any given moment because revelation comes to us in phases. There is what the Bible calls the current truth. The current truth or the present truth. There is a truth that is present and there is the former truth. And if you compare the former truth to the present truth, it appears as if the former truth is a lie. So we are growing in the word of God and maturing and discovering because each time we go through trials and problems that we seem not to be able to solve, we then need to investigate our belief system. Did we believe the right thing? Is there something wrong with the way that we apply scriptures to our day-to-day -day lives? And then that's when you then begin to find out that there are things that we believed that we shouldn't have. So giving your life to Jesus Christ, it is a very wrong approach. We have a problem as Christians because we gave our lives to God. What we should have done was to come to God to receive life from Him. A Christian is not a person who has given his life to God. A Christian is a person who has received life from God. That is the correct equation of salvation. You don't come to give life to him, you come to get life from him. So that answers why we have most of the problems that we have. Because we are in some certain sense competing with Jesus. He has come that you might have life and that you 
might have it in abundance. And in that equation, it is never you giving him life. It is him giving you life. And the reason why we don't have the life that he gave to us is because we never came to receive, we came to give. So the Bible says we were dead in our sins. So when you come to him, you don't even have a life to give. You don't even have a life to give. So it's wrong then to, for us to say, you come to God and you surrender your life. You don't have a life. You come to receive and to collect life from him. So salvation, it is never you giving God anything. It is God giving everything to you. So when you hear that, believe it and immediately begin to receive life from him. Can that really change anything? If somebody is to believe that, can that change anything in somebody's life? Yes. Yes. You are simply a sum total of your beliefs. If I would want to change your life, I have to change what you believe. If what you believe is not changed, then your lifestyle can never be changed. So from today, understand that you are never competing with Jesus. You are coming to receive from him. And he came that we might have life and have it in abundance. Okay, he says life and then he goes further to say in abundance. So there is life. There is another level of life. The abundant life. The greater life <laughs> and that life you see it has to be chosen you have to decide to live that kind of a life and it is given now as a prophet reading the heart and the mind of God what I can give to you now as the body of Christ in terms of the feeling that God has towards his church. I can tell you this as a prophet that God is not really excited. Christians, they have been God's only let down. He's not happy, he's not excited when he looks at Christians because we, the Christians, have really disappointed God. So what I'm presenting to you today, I've given it a title which is called Christ's Mission That Christians Made Impossible. Christ's mission that Christians made impossible. Christ's mission that Christians made impossible. Okay. Whose mission was it? Whose mission was it? Before we talk about the mission, whose mission was it? Christ. And who made it impossible? Okay. What was the mission? Now, I want you to look again at the book of John. 15 verse number 13, we just read it. It's a, it's a reminder. So you can, you can put it again on the screen. Greater love hath no man than this, which means this is the kind of love that you don't find in people. So stop looking for this kind of love. No one has it. It's a love that is so great that no human being can have it. 
Greater love hath no man than this. So now he's about to specify to you and explain to you the difference between many types of love. Okay, before I show you what I want you to see there, love is not the same. When Jesus says that you need to love your enemies, it is recorded in your Bible that your enemies ought to be loved by you. You need to love your enemies. And it is scriptural. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. Love your enemies. What does that mean? The love that he is referring to is different from what we think it is. I've heard so many people having problems when it comes to praying against our enemies. You hear many people saying, no, you can't pray against your enemy. Let's bring them to God. Let us help them to come to God. All that we can do is simply to love them, which is very true, but the love is different. There is a love that you love your enemy with. But if you want to take that scripture to be literal, then the devil himself also being your enemy has to be loved. So now imagine listening to yourself saying, I love the devil. What does that mean? So, which means that scripture requires some explanation. And again, those that have God. Okay, if you love your enemy with the same love that you love God with, how then is God going to know that he is not one of your enemies? If everyone should love his enemy, remember God is other people's enemy. So they should also love God. If you love God with the same love that you love uh, your enemy with, then how does God know that you really love him if the love is the same? Which means that love is not the same. The love that you love God with is different from the love that you love your enemies with. That is the only time when God can say, okay, now I'm loved by this person. Because he sees the different kind of love channeled towards him and a different love channeled towards your enemy. But take note of this, which is very, very important. Now, he goes further to explain. You can put the scripture back. I want you to see something. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. When a man lays down his life for a friend, he's calling us friends. That is where we have disappointed the men who laid down his life for a friend and he did it for a friend that doesn't value or understand the importance of life. How do you feel when you sacrifice and you lay down your life and then the person that you die for
doesn't place value on life. There is no greater disappointment than that. Christians, they have failed to understand the value and the importance of life. And yet we have a man that came and laid down his own life so that we can have it. And then no one is teaching people, no one is willing among us the Christians to then come and pick the life that was laid down by his friend and make it his own. It is still down there, laid down for us, and no one is ready to pick it up. We continue living our own lives which are miserable and we wonder why after being born again we still live a life as if we were never washed by the blood of Jesus. Why? Because there was never a point in our life, in our time when somebody decided to pick the life that was laid down by a friend. The life of Jesus is still on the floor. No one wants to pick it. That's the letdown that I'm talking about. As a prophet, I'm saying, he's not happy with you. God is not happy with you. Not at all. You have not made life your emphasis. You have not made life your focus. You have made health your focus. You have made money your focus. You have made every other thing, relationship your focus. You haven't made life life your focus you look at me when did we introduce the topic life here for how long have you been talking about life how many of you can remember hello was it like two weeks is it like two months it's quite a very long time because when this thing if we keep on saying this thing if this is what we keep on reading every time we come here and we see life, something happens to us. I'm trying to bring your attention to something which is very important. Life. Let me talk to some of you people here. Have you ever wondered what exactly it is that wakes you up every morning because when you go to bed and you sleep you are far away from your physical body you are no longer in control of your mind then the question is when you are down there maybe a thousand kilometers away from your physical body what then brings you back into your physical body and then you wake up. I know that maybe you haven't thought about that. And the reason is that you don't really value life. It's something that you should always think of. What wakes me up every morning? Is it my decision or somebody decides on my behalf? So if you are not in control if you cannot revive yourself from the sleep and say to yourself, it is morning, let me wake up. It's not even the alarm that wakes you up. But find out what it is that brings you back to life every morning. Let's say you don't know what it is, but at least know that there is something that does that job every time. You don't have a name for it, but there is something. Trust me, there is something that will wake you up every morning. What is that thing? The question again is, what if that thing decide not to come? What brings it back every time? That thing.
And that's the thing that we don't even thank God for. No one comes here to testify that I have a thing that comes to me, it falls upon me every morning and it wakes me up. It, it, it's, it's not a testimony that any of us here are willing to share. We don't appreciate life. We don't appreciate life. Now, get this. A friend comes and then he lays his own life down for his friend. That's exactly what Jesus did. Laid down his life. So that somebody here can come and pick it up and makes it his own. And you begin to live the life of Jesus. So he was living. Jesus was alive. When he got into the flesh, there was a life that he had. And he kept that life so perfect. And used the same life to perform miracles, signs and wonders. And when he died, that's when he laid it down so that somebody can pick it up and continue doing the same works that he was doing. So when you pick the life of Jesus, your life becomes a continuation of his life. You think like him, you talk like him, you walk like him, you do miracles, signs and wonders, you advise people the same way he would have advised people if he was around. Because it is no longer you that lives, but it is now him that lives. So somebody here, you have to make up your mind that I'm going to pick up that life and live it to its maximum. There are statements that I, in fact, truths that I have to keep on presenting to you until your mind gets soaked. And until then, your life cannot change. It is believed everywhere you go and every preacher tells you that Jesus died for you. And that's what the Bible tells us. God died for you. Jesus died for you. Not for himself, he died for you. And you hear that every week. God died for you. Okay, he died for you. He really died for you. The question is, then why should you die for yourself? That is the reason why the gospel of immortality has been criticized by some of the most spiritual guys and preachers. Immortality means deathless. Or death proof. Immortality means you live forever. Immortality means you don't have to die. You can't die, in fact. And that gospel, we have found ways of avoiding it in case eventually we die. And we look at those that have come before us and written scriptures, they have all died. So we make a doctrine out of what we see happening, not based on what is written. 
in the word of God. I'm here to announce to you that the truth is no one here after being born again was supposed to die. But listen to me now. What is now killing us it is not because the life has not been made available. It is the faith that is required for that life to be attained that we don't have. The faith. The faith. The faith. Jesus, if he came, if, let's say, let's say, okay, if he really came, if Jesus ever came, on this earth and then died for me and you it means there is somebody who took my place and your place in as far as death is concerned let's agree on that but again if we look at death it comes in different types again. There is the separation of the spirit of a man from God, and that is death. When a tree is uprooted from the ground, it begins to die because it is no longer connected to its source, which means trees draw life from the ground. You bring out a fish from the water, it dies because somehow it draws its life from the water. And when God created the fish, he commanded the sea to bring them forth. So when you are eating fish, you are eating something that was formed by God from water. Water was the material used by God to form fish, to create fish. So, that is why also, when you disobey your parents, you die early. The Bible says, honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, and so that you may live long. Which means your connection with your parents, that makes your parents your water. Your parents are your soil. When you are disconnected from your parents, you don't need any other person to place a case upon you. That disconnection on its own, it destroys you. So staying connected to your parents, your life is guaranteed. Am I talking to somebody here? So now, I'm trying to show you something here. So when a man that is born, from God. God said, let us make men in our own image and in our own likeness, which means you are a product of God. You came out of God. No matter who you are, you came out of God. So that which came out of God, if that which came out of God chooses to disconnect itself from its source, it begins to die. So the separation of your spirit from God is regarded as death. That's why those that are not connected to God, they are dead. So when we invite them to come to God, they can no longer hand over their lives to God because they don't have a life to give. They are dead, disconnected from God. So when you are separated from God, you are dead. When you are connected to God, you become alive. Okay? So where did men come from? From God. Every other thing, God commanded the ground to bring forth. And that which came from the ground, the moment it chooses to disconnect from the ground, it dies. The fish came from the water. The moment the fish says, I would want to go out and see what is happening, it will never return back into the sea. It will die. Which means the life of the fish is right next to the water. The fish has to remain in the water. Where did men come from? Out of God. 
let us make men. He came out of God in our own image. So now, that's the death. And there is another death which is physical. That is when your spirit checks out of your physical body. Your physical body dies. That's another death. And preachers now, when they talk about Jesus dying for us, they only talk about the spiritual death. That he came to die for us, which means he became separated with God on our behalf so that we can be united. So that's all they talk about, the spiritual death, because it is easy to preach. The spiritual death. Because there is no, there is no point when you are really going to investigate and find out he, he didn't really uh, die for that. So the, the spiritual death, the spiritual death. He died for us spiritually so that our relationship with God can be restored. So his death, he died for our spiritual death. So we don't have to die again spiritually. <laughs> Why we prefer that? It's very easy. It's very easy. That's a very easy sermon. To say the human spirit will never die. very easy but understand if he died only for our spirits why did he die physically because spiritual death does not require him to be hanged on the cross physically. Jesus was physical. His blood was physical. Israel, Jerusalem was physical. The cross was a physical cross. The nails and the hammer, all those were physical. The crown of thorns was a physical crown. And he died a physical death on whose behalf? Why only pick the spiritual death and leave the physical death that, that he died for you? It's a very complicated subject. God's original intention was for you never to die. <laughs> so if I see Jesus hanging on the cross. Thank God I went to Israel. I saw where they buried him. And it was a physical grave. He died physically. On my behalf. And then when I'm left, I'm then dying again physically for myself. The reason why we prefer death and we believe so much that we cannot do without it is because of a belief that if you don't die, there's no way you can go to heaven. As if it is death that qualifies you for heaven. And in actual fact, it is Jesus that qualifies you for heaven, not death. Why can a man not be taken to heaven when it is time without death's involvement we have men like that in the bible who went there 
they were seen coming to heaven without death ever touching their physical bodies. <laughs> you see it. 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 If this message doesn't excite you, I would want to meet you after the service and pray for you. <laughs> Jesus said to Mary and Martha, if you two girls can believe, today you will see the glory of God. And what was the glory of God? The bringing back of the man that had died to life. And I know that Lazarus was already in heaven at the time that Jesus prayed for the resurrection of Lazarus. He was in heaven. I know that not as a prophet, but through scripture. Jesus, the Lazarus that you love is sick. So any man that is loved by Jesus goes to heaven when he dies. So he is in heaven, in a better place, dead. And to bring back his spirit from heaven, back to earth, Jesus calls that the glory of God. <laughs> oh, ah, think about it. He's not being brought back from hell. Retaining a man that has gone to heaven, something that you think is glorious, dying and going to heaven to a better place. And Jesus says, if we can return him back to earth, where you think evil prevails, when we can bring him back from heaven, it is the manifestation of the glory of God. Now, 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 then, if the coming back of Lazarus from heaven to earth, from heaven to earth, that movement, that migration of the spirit of a man from heaven to earth, if God calls that the glory, which means your presence right now on earth is the glory of God. Ah, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. My God. My God. My God. My God. You see, he's not stopping Lazarus from burning in hell. He's bringing him back from heaven. And when you stay long down here, it is the glory. <laughs> <laughs> of God staying long on the earth is the glory of God if you think that death is the will of God then why do you fight it with medication why do you try to stop it? If death is the will of God, which means the doctors that we have, even in this ministry, they are not working for God, they are working against His will. which means every medical institution is satanic. 
Why? They are working against the will of God. Why cause people to live when God wants them dead? So I'm giving you this now. It will help you to live and investigate every message you hear from preachers. When they stand up there and say, every man has to die. So that when we die, we go to heaven. Make a follow-up. When he gets sick, the same preacher, you hear he's in the hospital. And yet a few days ago, you told us that if you are to die, where are you going? Heaven, where there is God. Now sickness has been sent. You now have to die and go to the heaven that you were talking about. Why are you being treated now? You want to live. So what you preach and what you do is contradicting each other. Each time you try, by all means, you look at a man while he is lying there in the hospital. Just by looking at his face, you can see the man is not ready to go. He swallows everything given to him. Takes every food that is brought to him. He vomits before he finishes his chewing the next day. No one wants to die. When the house is on fire, look at how people, let me say, walk out of that house. Do you see them walking? The same preacher who tells you if you die, you go to heaven and it's a good thing for you to die. From the church, you see him stopping at the red traffic light. Why did you stop? So we preach for death and support death. But then when we leave, we oppose that. Something within us tells us that we are supposed to leave. There is something inside of you that tells you it is the glory of God for you to leave. <laughs> you can say death is necessary. But why is it when it comes after you, you try to stop it by all means possible? And yet you say it is the will of God. Why fight the will of God? Why hire people, doctors, to fight against the will of God that is in your body? Why? It means your theology is false. Compare that to your practices. You understand something inside of you wants to hang on to life. Because we forget that we once preached about death. It is appointed for every man who wants to die. And after that comes the judgment, quoting scriptures. But when the same person survives an accident, he brings it to us in form of a testimony. I have a testimony. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, if you can look at the car, you won't even believe that I came out. You, you, you won't even believe. <sighs> Were you not supposed to have been in heaven right now? Why do you testify? 
Because that's the glory of God when you remain on earth. That is the glory of God. <laughs> I would have believed that uh, Jesus died only for my spiritual death if Jesus had died only a spiritual death. But now that he also died a physical death, I would want to go further and investigate why then did he die physically if I have to die physically for myself? Who was he dying for physically? The spiritual side, of course, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was because of your sins that were placed upon him and God could no longer look at evil again. And he turned his back on his son. So he took your place, which means he was separated from God spiritually. But why is he dying physically? Whether Peter died, whether Paul died, <laughs> still, they didn't have the faith that is required for them to live forever. Because Paul died, so who are we? All of us, we have to die. Okay. Remember again, Paul had a disease. Why are you then not enjoying yours? You want to copy him. You say, if Paul died, who are we not to die? Paul had a situation. Why is it that if you have a similar situation, you try to remove it? If there's a thorn in your flesh, you try to remove it. Paul had it. Why are you removing it? So there is a life that has been laid down by a man who once came and lived on this earth. And that life was a trained life. It's a qualified life. It's a life that he lived with on earth. Tried and tested life. And then when he was done with that life, he laid it down so that somebody here can come and pick it up. Now let's investigate life. What is it? Why should we live? Or why should we die? What's the point? Why should we die? Why are we supposed to die? What are the benefits? Because that's what we use to intimidate people. If we realize they don't want to come to God, My brothers and sisters, you die today, where shall you spend your eternity? And because of death, you see them coming. So they are coming, not because life has been presented. They are coming because of the fear of death. So the whole church is packed with people that did not come to God because of life. They came for the fear of death. Christians are the most fearful bunch of people.
Do you think we are saving God just for the sake of resurrection? That's not true. Resurrection? So you die and then you are raised from the dead? And that's what you're here for? Okay, who is not going to experience that? Who is not going to experience resurrection? Read your Bible carefully. In the book of Revelation, even those that died unsaved, they shall be raised from the dead for the judgment. They will still experience resurrection. So what's the difference between you and them if it is all about resurrection? Immortality was your advantage. So where is life? I believe that life is only one source and that is God. Life is a product of God. Life emanates from only one place, one source, God. Which means that life is created by one thing, and that one thing is who? Hello? What, that one thing is who? I can't hear. That one thing is who? Okay, so life is created only by one thing, but it can be taken or destroyed by many things. So I will show you now how life came to you. Look at... Um, Leviticus chapter number 17 and verse number 11. Let's read it together loud and clear. One, two, go. Okay. Read it again and then I will tell you to stop. One, two, go. Stop. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now, I believe the life of the flesh is really in the spirit. Now, I will explain that verse to you now. If God is the originator of life, it means the life that you have came from God to you. But which part of you exactly received life from God? It is your spirit. And then your spirit then hands over life to your blood. And your blood hands over life to the flesh. That is the diagram. You have God giving your spirit life. And you have your spirit giving your blood life. And you have your blood giving your flesh life. Now, follow this now. So if the verse, if the Bible says that the life of the flesh is in the blood. He has just presented it to you halfway. There are parts that he knows that you don't understand. So he doesn't want to waste time explaining all that. Some of us, we have all the time to explain. So, for, I can prove that. I, can, I wouldn't want to believe that the life of the flesh is in the blood. Why? Because... 
if the blood cannot live by itself outside of the flesh, then it doesn't have the life of its own. Can I, can I show you something here? My brothers and sisters, if you donate your blood today, it is taken out of your system. As long as you have it in your physical body, if it is inside of you, you haven't donated it. But when you see it outside, packaged some way, then you have donated your blood. And once the blood is outside of your veins, it has to be there. The maximum is just six weeks. After six weeks, if they haven't been able to transfer that blood into somebody's body, then they have to pick it up and throw it away. So it's not every blood that you donated that helped somebody. Some of it was thrown away. It's just that you are not told. And you move around thinking that you have helped a lot of people. You haven't helped anybody. And also the blood of Jesus can suffer again the same problem after being donated and then nobody uses it. So the fact that he died and his blood was shed doesn't mean that the, his blood was then used. It is up to us to use the blood that was offered and donated on our behalf. So now, back to my point, back to my point, back to my point. So 42 days, once the blood is outside of your physical body, it dies. Why do they throw it away? It is dead. So where was its own life coming from? If the life of the flesh is in the blood, if the life of the flesh is in the blood, if the life of the flesh is in the blood, then the blood outside of the flesh has to live. But then why if we remove the blood from the flesh, we see the blood dying? If it was the one giving life to the flesh, then it shouldn't die outside of the flesh. Are you following this? So if we see the blood outside of the flesh dying, it means there is something that was also giving life to the blood as long as the blood remains in the flesh. So, 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 so follow this now. I'll give you another example that will help you. Let's say the blood is not even taken out of your body. Man of God, it remains there. It remains, you have your blood. I don't know how many liters are contained in a human body, but let's say you have all of your blood contained in your physical body. And yet you hear, that is what I'm not using you as an example here. And then you hear that a man goes to bed and he didn't wake up in the morning. He's dead. <laughs> And then you, you, you rush in there you, only to find out he's cold. He's dead. He's gone. They will do what they call a post-mortem. Trying to investigate what killed the man. But if you check around the person where he was lying, you don't even see even a drop of blood which means he never lost any and yet he died when the blood was in the flesh so how did he lose his life 
if the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood is in the body and the body dies. Why? Because as long as you have, if your life is really from your blood, you don't have to die unless you lose your blood. If you still have your blood, why should you die? I've seen men die without losing blood. So if you find yourself dying while you still have your blood inside of you, it means your life is never from the blood that you carry. There is something that overrides everything, the flesh and the blood. And that is the godly spirit that is given to you by God. Why should a man with his blood, all of it, die. If the life of the flesh is in that same blood, the blood could not stop the man from dying. Which means it is never the source of his life. Be seated. Be seated. Be seated. Oh. Oh, 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 oh. So, your spirit received life from God, and your spirit hands over life to your blood, and your blood hands over life to your flesh. If the spirit decides to quit, if your spirit resigns today, then your blood dies and ultimately your flesh also dies. And I believe that everything that lives has the spirit of God. Everything. everything whether it's a tree or a stone everything has the spirit of God because anything that God touches it receives a portion of him there is the godliness that is left on anything that God touches when God touches a tree that tree becomes a living thing. There is the spirit of God in everything that is alive. And it is that spirit that gives life to that thing. And when the spirit quits, the thing dies. A tree can get sick up to a point where its spirit departs. And you see the tree withering and yet it is still standing on the ground, still connected to its source. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, he didn't hire a dozer. It remained there. He simply cursed the life supply system. And it died. Still connected to its source. Where it thought it gets life from. There is something that gives us life. Which is superior to what we see. Which means right where you are now. Your spirit should be trained. To be active every day in terms of providing life. The spirit that received life from God should always hand over life to the blood on a daily basis. That flaw should never be disturbed. God, 
to the spirit, spirit to the blood, blood to the body. You get sick, very sick, very sick to the point where your spirit quits. And then a man dies. And I will declare to you very soon in a few days to come what I regard to be the killing time. There is a time that kills. The killing time. It is not a disease that kills the person. Because I've seen a person without a disease dying. And people wonder. And I've seen a person with a disease taking some notes. Praising God. <laughs> Clapping his hands. Ignoring my sermon. <laughs> there is a killing time, a zone that you enter. <laughs> and when you enter that <laughs> time, no matter you don't have a disease. <laughs> it is the time that kills you. It's never the accident that kills the person. No disease can kill you. No? There's no disease that can kill you. You can be sick for 100 years as long as your spirit decides to stay in there. You will still be in pain for the rest of your life and never die. There is no disease that kills you. So what death does is It doesn't want to be accused of killing anybody. So death hides behind accidents and diseases. When a man dies, you do a post-mortem and they discover a disease. Then they remove their gloves and say, we have found out what really killed the man. And yet there is another man with the same disease who is not dead. So death hides behind situations, accidents, sicknesses, diseases, and so on. So a disease in your physical body is a forerunner of death. Death if he kills you because death is a person, I will show you scriptures. We are starting to work on our theme here. Death is a person and before he comes, there is a forerunning. There is an escort that goes ahead of him. There is a John the Baptist that prepares the way for the death before he comes. And that John is what you call disease. So that when death comes and he strikes, you will not blame death, you will blame the disease. 
And no one really can treat death. People treat diseases. And this sermon is what treats death. Mm -hmm. This teaching is what treats death. Have you noticed that uh, if you two seconds before you sneeze there is something that goes ahead of the sneeze. Before you sneeze, you feel it, it's coming. Okay? That thing that comes before I want to take that as a disease that comes before you die there is always something that happens before a man dies and most people before they die they know it but not everyone gets an opportunity to tell his friends because it can happen during the same night, within an hour, you can actually see your spirit departing. There is something that happens before a man dies. <laughs> Some of you, you are reluctant you don't get excited when life is coming to you is because you haven't sensed the presence of death in your house the day he walks in you will know he's here death is a person that visits people So, if you are sick and you don't want to die, just let your spirit remain. Somehow, non-believers have a concept. You see in movies where a soldier is shot, wounded, bleeding. And the friends are cheering him up. Hold on, hold on. Don't die. Don't die. Don't die. Just hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. As if there is a way that somebody can still hold on to life. You negotiate with your spirit. Don't leave my body. Remain inside. <laughs> Death is something that can be argued with. <sighs> Am I talking to somebody here? Last chapter for today, Deuteronomy 30, verse 19.
I, God, call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, my advice to you as God, please choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, in closing today, unless you don't believe in the Bible, tell me God is lying to me. Tell me God is cheating me. Otherwise, how would God bring before me life and death and then ask me to choose if I cannot choose if death and life is something that is beyond my choice or beyond my control, then why does God ask people to choose either life or death? If death has to automatically come upon me, why then am I asked to choose And then he tells you to choose life and leave death. Do you mean that this is something that can be chosen? Of course, believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. God would not give you that opportunity if you can't choose. So the one that lives, lives based on his decision and on his choice. And the one that dies, dies when he chooses to, when he chooses to, when he chooses to, which means somehow there is a moment in your life when death and life is presented before you. And you only die when you choose. If I'm wrong, if this doctrine is heresy, then you bring yours and then you interpret for me. How is it possible for a man to choose life if it cannot be chosen? For you to be alive, Maybe it wasn't your decision. But for you to live is a decision that you need to make. For you to know that death can be chosen, take some poison now. If you thought God is in control, if you thought God is in charge of life and death, he is in charge in terms of providing life. But in terms of maintaining it and staying alive, you are in charge. And that's the reason if you want to die today, Sunday, 
You won't die tomorrow. You will die today. Why? The choice is yours. So if you can choose to die today and still die today, it means you can choose to live tomorrow and live tomorrow. The choice is yours. How do we choose death? How do we choose life? We choose death and we choose life by what do we choose to do. We will continue with that verse and he says, if you want to live, obey my commandments. Follow my instructions. So you will never find life lying down like that, even if it was laid down. You will find life hidden in the word of God, instructions of God. If you obey the voice of God, you live. You live. It will be very, very disturbing for you to understand today that all that died chose to die. That's the word of God. Not knowing, of course, but they chose. You can get to the terminus and you find seven, eight, nine taxis parked there, ready to pick somebody. And then you choose the one with a broken tire. Not knowing, of course, but your choice. Out of ignorance, still you chose. Because the ignorant will still choose. Have you ever done multiple choice at school? Even if you don't know, you will still choose. You choose. Your intelligence will help you to choose and also your ignorance it will assist you on what to choose you choose out of ignorance death is chosen when we choose certain friends death is chosen when we choose certain advices from wrong people that is when death is chosen who sees death and choose it? No one. No one. But it hides behind the things that we choose. <laughs> choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Life is a choice. Life is like a miracle. When a person receives a miracle from God, it comes from who? From God. To you. But who decides how long the miracle is going to last? It's you. So you saw on that scripture, death was placed before you and life, blessing, and a curse. But if you, move, if, you, if, if you move around telling people that every cursed man chose to be cursed, the cursed will never agree with you. And yet God knew that you were going to deny that he ever gave you that opportunity. And then he says, I will call upon heaven and earth to record this today. Lest you say I'm moving around killing people. I want the heavens to come and see 
whilst people are choosing death and they die as a result of their own decisions. It's not me. God is not in the business of killing people. He is in the business of giving life to people. And we can decide how long we live on earth. That's why a man carrying a bomb can walk into the building. And then he explodes, kills tens and tens of thousands of people. Where is God when that happens? He's away. He originates life. He gives you life. But how long you can live, it is up to you to decide. You can kill each other. You can kill yourself by the things that you do. And God is not responsible. A miracle that you receive from God, you can lose it. And God is no longer responsible. Hang on to life no matter what you go through. My sisters, my brothers, hold on to life. Negotiate with your spirit. No matter what I'm going through today, I shall not die. I will live to declare the works of the Almighty God. Don't die, my brother. Please don't die. No matter the situation, no matter the problems that you go through, just hold on to life. Don't die. Don't die. Shout, I will live. And I will not die. Put your hands together for Jesus. Heavens are open and your glory we see.